Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From time to time, um, all kinds of people, from psychologists to self-help gurus to life coaches, uh, they'll write books that try to kind of help us with the big picture sort of stuff in our lives. And wh- whether, they're, whether their advice is to take the bull by the horns or stop and smell the roses or whatever they give, most of those books will, will kind of deal with two major questions. One of those questions is, who are you? And the other one is, where are you going? Usually, who are you comes first. And, and normally, in books like that, uh, the question is largely answered by self-reflection. So looking in yourself, the, the, our identity is almost always pictured as, as coming from like here or here or our gut or something like that. But whether it's your, your head or your heart or your gut, the idea is always you dig into yourself far enough and you'll find the core of your being. You'll find what makes yourself tick. You know, uh, you can take tests that will try to answer the question who you are. And those, quest- those tests, they're almost always full of questions that will ask stuff like uh, how you feel about certain things or how you react to uh, different situations and scenarios and that kind of stuff. And then the second question, where are you going, it, it's almost always based mainly on your answer to the first question. So you've figured out who you are and what are you going to do with that person? You know, what direction are you going to take in your life? What are your goals? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? And there's really nothing wrong with those things. It's not a bad thing to know something about yourself. It's not a bad thing to know your preferences. It's not a bad thing to know something about your goals. The problem is books that purport to help us with those big picture things that answer those questions, they almost always confuse those, those questions which are identity questions, destination questions, they almost always confuse them with vocation. They almost always confuse them with the topic of our last sermon series, God at work, you know. Uh, it was all about vocation. And those questions are all about the gifts and the talents and the, the stuff that God gives you that you can use in the world as you work as as a parent or as a child or as a spouse or as an employee. And the problem is those questions really aren't about vocations at all. Who are you and where are you going? Those are questions about identity. They're questions about destination. And Scripture says the answer to those questions actually is not inside of you at all. It's not in your mind. It's not in your heart. It's not in your gut. It's not there. They're all external Your identity, your destination, that is given to you. It doesn't come from inside of you. It's given to you. And Scripture answers those questions basically in two different ways. It has two different answers to those questions. Who are you? Where are you going? The first answer is actually very, very simple and very, very direct. It's what we say tonight. You are dust. To dust you shall return. In a few minutes when we do the imposition of ashes, you'll come up, we'll put those ashes on your forehead, and we'll probably look you in the eye, and we'll say those very words, you are dust, and from dust, and to dust you shall return. See, those are the words of the curse. Those are the words from Genesis 3, 19. They're the words that God speaks to our first uh, father, Adam, after the fall into sin. And there's something Scripture says to us too. Because see, those words remind us of something about ourselves. They tell us exactly who we are. I mean, for one thing, they remind us that we are creation. We are creatures that God made from dust. And we're creatures whose ultimate destiny is to go back where we came from. Our ultimate destiny is to be dust. That's the curse. That's the result of sin. See, sin means separation from God. It means separation from the Holy One. That's why Adam and Eve get expelled from the garden. That's why there's a flood. That's why God almost doesn't go with the Israelites when they go out into the wilderness after that whole golden calf business, remember? Sin creates separation. Sin creates a chasm that we can't cross because a just and a holy and a righteous God cannot exist with sinners. You can't exist with sinful people. Sin causes separation, and the ultimate result of separation 
It's death. This Lenten season, our sermon series is called The Ten Gifts. And what we're looking at is the Ten Commandments. We're going to look at them in terms of the gifts of God that lie behind those commandments. And as we look there, we're going to see a whole bunch of things. We're going to see, of course, some of the stuff that God hates. And we're going to see some of the stuff that God loves. And most of all, we're going to see the heart of God in the life and the passion and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But before we start digging into the specifics of the commandments, which we'll do on Sunday, but before we start doing that, we're beginning with some generalities tonight. One biblical truth is that God hates sin, and God hates the effects of sin as well, especially death. But that's a curse. Death is the curse. That is the condemnation that we brought on our own heads as sinful human beings. And it means distance. It means distance from God. It means distance from our Heavenly Father. It means a return to dust. And ultimately, it means eternal death, eternal separation, eternal condemnation. So that's one answer that God's Word gives to our questions for tonight. Who are you and where are you going? You are dust, and to dust you shall return. That answer is called the law. It's the bad news. And the law doesn't mess around. It doesn't mess around at all. The law shows us exactly as we are. It shows us all the sin, and it shows us exactly where we're going as well. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. But that's only one of the two answers in God's Word to those questions. The other answer is called the Gospel. The other answer is the good news. And the Gospel's right in our epistle reading for tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. They say this, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel. That's the other answer to the question. And pay, pay very close attention to the words here. First of all, notice that the first, uh, the first bit of our reading is be reconciled to God. See, if the law is separation, the gospel is reconciliation. The gospel is return. You see this sometimes in earthly relationships. Married couples, unfortunately, sometimes separate when they're going through conflict. And I have to tell you, that's not a good thing, obviously. But when they get back together, that's something truly beautiful. Truly beautiful, not only because the relationship is restored, although it is beautiful that, for that reason, but it's not just that the relationship is restored and preserved, it's also that the love is tested. And that's reconciliation. It's the bringing back together. And reconciliation only happens. It only happens when something changes. You can't change anything about your separation from God. You can't do it. You, after all, are dust, and to dust you shall return. But the second answer to who are you and where are you going is in these verses. From 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it's right here. Who are you? You are the righteousness of God. That's what it says. You are the righteousness of God. And where are you going? Reconciliation. You're going back to the one who created you. You're going back to the one who saved you. You're going back to the one who loves you. Back to the one who sent Jesus. The one who sent Jesus to live a life that was free from sin. And who took on your sin. See, because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us and to die in your place. That's what the sinless sinner does, Jesus. He returns to the ground, to the place that you and I are destined for, but he bursts out of it after three days so that you will one day rise from the grave as well. You'll get up from the dust and you will become a living, breathing, restored, and renewed, and reconciled creature. That's what the love of God does. God loves reconciliation. God loves bringing back together, bringing his people to him. God loves his creation enough to die for it. 
And that means God loves you enough to make sure that the separation would be overcome and that you would be his. Reconciliation is never easy. And it's never cheap. And no more so than in our relationship with God. It did not come easily and it did not come cheap. It cost the father his son. It cost the son his life. But listen, because this is really important and really true, especially on Ash Wednesday. The gospel means that you are worth the blood of Christ. And let me say that again because I want you to remember it. The gospel means that you are worth the blood of Jesus. Tonight we reflect on our sin as we begin our Lenten journey. Tonight we reflect on the answers Scripture gives us for who we are. And tonight especially we reflect an awful lot on the law. The fact that we've done stuff that God hates. But don't miss the fact that even though it's true that you are dust and to dust you shall return, it is also true that even though you are sinful, even though you are dust, you are truly and deeply and fully loved. Remember, reconciliation can only happen when something changes and in your baptism, God changed the answer to who you are. Pay attention one more time to the words of 2 Corinthians 5.21, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what it means to be baptized into Jesus Christ. God made you different through Jesus. God made you different in your baptism. God made you different when he reconciled you to himself because God made you his righteousness. And because of Jesus, he changed the answer to that second question, too. Where are you going? You are going to be with him. And he's already with you. He's with you in this season of repentance. He's with you in your journey, our journey, to the celebration of the cross and the resurrection. And in the meantime, he's with you at your work. He's with you at your school. He's with you at your home. He's with you here in your church. And even though you're going to walk out of here a little later, carrying dust on your forehead, and even though the law answer is still going to be true when you leave, the gospel answer will be too. You will walk out of here as the righteousness of God. You will walk out of here carrying with you the love of God, whose name is Jesus. To him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.